Number one, disassemble the piano. A, inspect the piano. While the mover is still present, inspect the piano thoroughly, pointing out any damage. It is also important to record the damage on an inspection sheet and take pictures if possible. B. Remove the music desk, ball board, and key slip from the piano. The music desk is easy to remove as it will typically just slide or lift out of the piano. It is a good idea to carefully place all case parts so they will not be damaged while the piano is being worked on. Some key slips are held down by a wedge between the key slip and the key locks. To remove this type of key slip, remove the screws holding the key blocks down against the key bed. Often there is a folding wing nut on the bottom of the key bed making this type of key block quite easy to remove. If the fallboard is not mounted on the key block, remove the key blocks from the piano and then remove the key slip. Another type of key slip is designed with a slot in the back of the key slip that slides friction tight over a hidden screw in the end of the key block. On this style, the key slip will slide up and off the screw head in the end of the key blocks. Some fall boards are attached to the cheek blocks at each end of the keyboard. On this style, the screws holding the cheek blocks must first be removed. Typically, the screw is found directly underneath the keybed. After the fasteners are removed, the fallboard and key blocks are removed as a unit. Be careful as the key blocks often come off the fallboard easily when the piano no longer prevents them from doing so. If the key block were to fall to the floor, damage can occur. Some key slips are attached to the keybed with screws. The screw heads are found on the bottom of the key bed. Remove the screws and lift the key slip out of the piano. C. Mark the location of the key frame on the key bed. Make sure that during removal of the fallboard and key blocks, the key frame has not moved. If there is any doubt, put the key blocks back into place and use the key frame guides in the key block to position the action correctly. Gently remove the key blocks, being careful not to move the action. Draw a line around the key frame on the key bed. This will help you place the key frame correctly later in the process. Make side to side marks on the front rail to aid in positioning the key frame later in the process. Get a piece of wood, anything will do, one to two inches square with a square end. Mark three positioning lines between the front rail and the key bed equally spaced across the key frame. Place the piece of wood against both the front rail and the key bed. Without moving the block of wood, use a scribe to mark a line on both the front rail and the key bed. These positioning lines will ensure that you will be able to place the action side to side later in the process. Make front to back marks between the end of the keyframe and the keybed. These marks will help you position the keyframe accurately front to back later in the process. Remove the key blocks without moving the keyframe. Using the same process as on the front rail, place the block of wood against both the keybed and the keyframe and make alignment marks for front to back positioning using a sharp pencil. Do this at both ends of the keyboard. You now have the ability to easily position the keyframe on the keybed whenever that is needed during the process. D. Measure key height. E. Front key height. Key height is an important measurement that must be taken at this point. Later you will need to set the height of the keys back to their original height. Use a ruler to measure from the top of the key top to the top of the key bed. F. Remove the action from the action cavity. With your hand vertical and the guide pins between your fingers, pull the action from the action cavity and place it on a workbench. Be careful. 
It is easy to damage the action with this operation. If your hand depresses either end key to any extent at all, it will cause the corresponding hammer to rise. When you pull the action forward, the hammer will catch on the plate or pin block, likely breaking either a hammer shank or worse, a hammer. If G, back key height. You will need this measurement later on to calculate the length of the solenoid. Use a ruler to measure the distance between the bottom of the key and the key bed. Do this at the end of each section of the piano. Likely you will see variance in these numbers. When you set up level and dip for the keyboard after the PD installation, you will need to set a spec for the back key height and then hold it. H. Mark the left-right location of the sostenuto hook on the key bed. Disconnect the sostenuto pitman from the sostenuto hook. Use a six inch rule to find the center of the sostenuto hook. With the square, transfer this mark to the key bed. I, lid removal. It is optional as to whether or not you remove the lid. Tape the hinge pins to the appropriate hinge to ensure that the hinge pins do not get lost during the installation. If you remove the lid, as with the other case parts, store in a safe location and in a safe manner so no damage will result. If you leave the lid on the piano, secure the lid with a rubber band so it cannot fall. J. Place the piano on its side. At this point, place the piano on a skid. K. Mark the locations on the key bed and legs. With the piano on its side, use a soft lead pencil to draw the outline of the left and right legs. On the top of each leg, mark the location on the piano. Customarily, the base key bed leg is number one, the treble key bed leg is number two, and the leg under the base bridge is number three. This information will be indispensable later when the portions of the legs will likely be cut away. 2. Remove the key bed, if possible. A. Determine if key bed removal is possible. If possible, the job of installing a piano disc system is much easier if the piano allows you to remove the key bed from the instrument. Many, but by no means all newer pianos allow removal of the key bed. A number of older pianos, as well as all Steinway pianos, do not. B. Check Appendix A of this manual. Appendix A of this manual contains a list of piano makes with easily removable key beds. While Piano Disc has tried to help you out here, this list cannot possibly be all-inclusive. However, if the piano you are working on is not on the list, the key bed may still be removable. C. If in doubt, check to see if the key bed is glued onto the rim and belly rail. If the key bed is not glued to the rim and belly rail, you will be able to remove the key bed. If you find that the key bed is removable, do so. Otherwise, you will be working inside the action compartment rather than on the bench. On the bench is much more convenient and sensible if possible. D. Set up locating pins for the key bed. Check to see if the manufacturer included position pins. It is important to get the key bed back to its original location. Also, with the pins in place, it is much easier to remove and install the key bed. When you remove the key bed screws, the locating pins will keep the key bed from falling until you are ready to physically move the key bed to a bench. Sometimes the manufacturer's position pins are inadequate or were not used. Sometimes the original pins are flimsy. 
If this is the case or the manufacturer failed to provide position pins, you will need to install pins of your own choosing for the installation of the piano disc system. You will find that a sturdy, good quality position pin will help with keybed removal and later keybed reinstallation. To install pins, Piano Disc recommends the WNG stainless steel positioning pins. This pin has a diameter of 5 16 inches or 8 millimeters, a length of 3 inches or 75 millimeters long and is tapered at both ends. The pin is sturdy and because it is made from stainless steel will not corrode. Mark for two locating pins. There should be a pin on each side of the piano far enough apart to adequately locate a key bed. Piano disc prefers location pins centered in the belly rail, however at the end of the arms will also work well. Note. Drilling the holes for the locating pins is a two-step process. The hole in the rim or the belly rail needs to be an interference fit. That is, the hole should be smaller than the pin by about a sixty-fourth of an inch. The hole in the key bed should be larger than the hole in the rim or belly rail, about the actual size of the pin. Drill the hole in the rim or belly rail. Choose a drill bit about a sixty-fourth of an inch smaller than the pin you intend to use. Drill through the key bed so that the hole in the belly rail or rim is about an inch and a half or forty millimeters deep. Make sure you drill in a true vertical to the key bed surface because angled pins will make your life quite difficult when removing and reinstalling the key bed. Use a drill guide to drill a straight hole. Drill the clearance hole in the key bed. Measure the thickness of the key bed. Select a drill bit as close to the actual size of the locating pin as you can. Tape a flag on the drill bit so that the depth you drill corresponds to the thickness of the key bed. Again, be sure you drill in a true vertical fashion to follow the original hole you drilled into the belly rail or rim. Drive the location pin into the hole until it is flush with the key bed. When pounding in a locating pin, it is important to not mushroom the head of the pin. To this end, use a hammer that is softer than the pin. A good choice is a brass or plastic hammer. E. Remove the key bed. Prepare saw horses or some other support on which to put the key bed after you remove it from the piano. Remember that the edges of the key bed are finished, so care is in order. Remove the screws holding the key bed onto the piano. Lift the key bed off the locating pins and place the key bed onto supports upside down. F. Mark the location of the shift lever support blocks on the key bed. Draw a line around the blocks that support the shift lever. Later on you will use these lines to decide if you need to move the pedal wire forward. G. Mark the location of the key bed log on the key bed. Draw a line around the key bed log on the key bed. This will allow you to move the lyre and key bed log a specific distance forward later on if needed. H. Remove trap work. Remove all pedal trap work from the bottom of the key bed. Mark a line 3 inches or 76 millimeters forward from the center of the shift lever hole as a reference. Be very accurate with this measurement. At the 3 inch location, place an intersecting line. This is an important step as the hole for the shift lever may be removed by the key solenoid slot cut. I. 
Measure and mark sauce noodle pitman hole on the key bed. Draw a line perpendicular to the front of the key bed through the center of the sauce noodle pitman hole for the future reference. It is best to place this reference line on the bottom of the key bed. It is not necessary to reference the location of the sustain hole as this will be determined by the sustain pedal solenoid location later. J. Remove the action stack from the keyboard. Place the top action and screws in a safe place. Three, measure for key access. A, determine if you must omit key solenoids. Typically at the high and low ends of the piano, the piano disc unit will extend under the legs. To create the necessary room, some portion of the leg is cut away. Sometimes the customer objects or perhaps there are very high value custom art case legs. For whatever reason, if you are not able to cut the legs down for room, then you will need to omit key solenoids. It is no problem to drop two or three solenoids at each end of the piano. You will need to measure how far the leg protrudes under the keys and drop solenoids accordingly so that the slot the piano disc system is installed into no longer extends under the legs. Sometimes the leg mounting system doesn't allow removal of material from the legs. A number of pianos attach the legs to the key bed with bolts that go through the leg top into metal plates embedded into the key bed. These plates cannot fall in the slot for solenoids, otherwise you will lose one of the leg attachment points. In this case, you will need to omit solenoids so as to keep the slot for the piano disc unit safely inside the leg mounting points. Use the following steps to determine your course of action. in the piano. Measure from the action stop block to the treble side of the leg bolt plate. This measurement should be taken parallel to the front of the key bed. This is measurement X in figure 1A. Transfer this measurement to the keyframe. See figure 1B. Measure from the action stop block to the base side of the treble leg bolt plate. Again, this measurement should be taken parallel to the front of the key bed. This is measurement Y in figure 1A. Transfer this measurement to the keyframe. See figure 1B. Note. There must be 5 eighths inch or 16 millimeters from the side of the key end to the end of the solenoid slot for access. Key bed off the piano. Mark a line on the key bed at each end of the slot due to leg plates or legs that are not to be cut for access to the keys. Place the keyframe on the key bed at the locating marks made earlier in step 1C. Mark the keyframe for the number of notes that will be left off each end of the solenoid tray. B. Making the key stick. At the front of the keys, notes are evenly spaced from left to right. Typically notes are numbered starting at 1 in the bass to 88 in the treble. Note, there are pianos that have more than 88 notes, but the piano disc system only recognizes 1 to 88. The back of the keys are divided into sections that correspond to plate bars in the piano. Often, but not always, there will be four sections. The bass is group 1, the tenor is group 2, sometimes there are two tenor sections, the lower treble is group 3, and the high treble is group four. The spaces between these groups are referred to as breaks. 
C, decide how to deal with sections that have an odd number of notes. There are important differences between the new low profile piano disc system and the old. The new system has two rows of solenoids instead of one. The row closest to the capstans is referred to as front. The row closest to the end of the keys is referred to as back. Each solenoid bracket assembly mounts two solenoids. The bracket is designed so one end mounts on the front mounting rail and the other mounts on the back mounting rail. The bracket positions the solenoids in two rows between the two mounting rails. The bracket is designed to be mounted at an angle so that the solenoid on the front rail falls under one key and the solenoid on the back rail falls under the next note higher in the piano. It is not possible to mount the bracket at the opposite angle. An important consideration to keep in mind is that it's, it is important to keep the length of the slot in the key bed as short as possible. Among other reasons, this minimizes the clearance cuts in the legs that will be required. To this end, solenoid bracket assemblies need to be mounted so that the end solenoids fall on the end key at the top and bottom of the scale. At the lowest note in the piano, usually note number one, numbering schemes can differ. This presents no problem as the solenoid for note one is the front solenoid and the solenoid for note two is on the back solenoid. All you need to do is mount the bracket at the appropriate angle and everything will work. At note 88, if there is an even number of notes in the section, there will be no problem as the last solenoid, the back solenoid, will fall on note 88. If you have omitted solenoids, then the highest and lowest note numbers are where you will need to start numbering for the PD system. Not all sections have an even number of notes. If the note count is not even, then the approach needs to be different. There are no single solenoid brackets. They all provide two solenoids. This means that in a section with an odd number of notes, there will be one extra solenoid. If the front solenoid were to fall on note 88, the extra solenoid would fall on the non-existent note 89. This would require extra room in the slot and more material removed from the leg. While the system would likely work, this is not a good idea. Note, picture above is only for a reference. Do not assemble solenoid rails until instructed. It is better to match solenoids to keys in the high treble starting from note 88 and working down in the section. The extra solenoid will then fall in the break between the low treble and high treble. It is okay to have a back solenoid on say note 72 and a front solenoid in the break. See illustration above. Customarily for any solenoid that will not operate a note you will simply cut the wire and remove the plunger. The kit will always provide spares, so there will always be enough. Count the notes in each section. For those sections with an odd number of notes, decide where the extra solenoids will be placed. Once you have made these decisions, you are ready to make a key scale stick. D. Make a scale stick from the back of the keys. You will need a stick of wood that is about two inches or 50 millimeters longer than the distance from the outside of note one to the outside of note 88. This stick should be about a quarter of an inch or six millimeters thick. The dimensions for length and thickness do not need to be precise. The width of the scale stick should be about 9 sixteenths of an inch or 14 millimeters because this is the available space between the solenoid rows when the diameter of the stems is taken into account. 
It is important to be reasonably accurate when cutting the width of the scale stick. Otherwise, there will not be ample room to space the solenoids apart. Place the blank key scale stick on the back of the key, approximately 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters in from the back of the key. Tape the strip onto the keys so it is not able to move. Mark the base end of the key scale stick so you do not accidentally set up the solenoids backwards later. Mark the strip with a sharp pencil on alternating sides where the scale stick intersects the center of the keys. Start at note number one in the base. Remember that when working on the back of the keys, the base keys are to your right. Mark note one on the front side of the strip. Mark note two on the back side of the strip. If you have odd numbered sections, mark from the end with no spare. Mark all 88 notes in the piano in this fashion. Four, measuring for keyframe cut. A, remove the keys from the keyframe. Remove all keys from the keyframe except the end keys in each section. It is best to store them in order 1 to 88 as it makes reassembly much easier. If the numbers on the keys are not easy to read, renumber the keys with a ballpoint pen behind the capstans so that the numbers do not show after the action is attached to the keyboard. Okay. Note. When measuring to cut the key rest felt, if most of the felt will be cut away or there is no loose felt, just the glued on portion, then you should carefully remove the felt and relocate it forward to the cut line. It will be necessary to re-level keys later. B. Mark the rail cloth for the keyframe cut. Measure from the end of the first and last key in each section an inch and a half or 40 millimeters towards the front of the key. Mark this point on the key frame felt with a permanent black marker. This dimension will leave the key frame hanging over the slot by about 11 sixteenths of an inch or 18 millimeters. The clearance from the key frame to the solenoid row will be about 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters. The purpose of this approach is to preserve as much of the keyframe as possible. Mark a straight line from the points with a straight edge and permanent black marker. Use a lid rubber band to secure the balance and front rail punchings from falling off while the keyframe is inverted. Weave the rubber band through the front and balance rail pins for this purpose. C. Mark the bottom of the back rail for the keyframe cut. Note, the purpose of marking the keyframe cut line on the bottom of the keyframe is to see if there is support or not. The keyframe is cut from the top side. Turn the keyframe upside down. Measure from the end of the number 1 and 88 keys towards the front of the keys an inch and a half or 40 millimeters and mark on the bottom of the keyframe. This is the keyframe cut line. Note, if less than two inches width of rest rail is left after the keyframe cut, it is recommended that some reinforcement be added to the front of the rest rail before cutting the keyframe. Measure from the end of number one and number 88 keys towards the front of the keys, two and five sixteenths inches or 58 millimeters. Mark this dimension on the bottom of the keyframe for the bead or keyframe support. Note, it may be necessary to extend the shift lever contact point on the keyframe. D. Determine if the back rail needs additional support after it is cut back to the required dimension. Customarily, the bottom side of a keyframe is recessed by about an eighth of an inch or so, except for a relatively narrow strip 
on the front rail and on the back rail. This narrow strip is called the bead. When the keyframe is cut back for piano disc installation, this bead may be either too small or entirely removed, leaving no support for the back rail on the key bed. If this is the case, you will need to recreate the bead further in on the back rail. Measure the height of the old bead with calipers. Some pianos also have recessed areas in the key bed that need to be taken into account. Kawai is a perfect example of a recessed key bed. If this is so, then it would be important to shim the key bed flush 1 inch or 25 millimeters in front of the key bed cut line for proper support before cutting the slot. Five, create back rail bead on keyframe if required. A, prepare the shim. There are a few different methods of replacing the bead or support. Clear pine or softwood molding in a continuous one inch wide strip. Place five one inch by two inch pieces of softwood equally spaced on the keyframe or iron-on veneer in continuous strip of five one-inch by two-inch pieces equally spaced. The iron-on veneer comes with self-adhesive, which can be ironed on activating the glue. Glue the shim onto the keyframe. Apply a thin coat of good quality structural wood glue. In the United States, Tight Bond is a brand name sold by Franklin that would be a good example. Apply glue to the new bead and clamp it to the keyframe. Usually a number of spring clamps will do this job quite well. Allow the glue to dry for about an hour. Sand the shim to correct height. C. Kawai Key Beds. Kawai pianos have a key bed cutout or recessed areas as you can see in illustration 31. The best way to fix this is to build up the area for the new bead so there is a level contact surface. Glue one inch shim stock of the appropriate thickness in the two cutout areas and sand flat after drying. Six, cut the keyframe. Note, because of moving the shift lever forward, it is important to check the contact area on the keyframe. Please see the addendum 2 on page 79 at the end of this manual. A. Cut the back rail cloth. The back rail cloth needs to be cut back prior to cutting the back rail if needed. Use a sharp knife or razor blade to cut the line you marked on the back rail cloth earlier. B. Cut the back rail. Use a jigsaw to cut the keyframe to the line previously marked. Remember, the keyframe will hang over the slot so that it is 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters from the center line of the front row of solenoids. C. Caution. You need to remove the back rail between the action cleats. Make sure you do not cut the action cleats. D. Remove the key bed log. E. Turn key bed over so top side is up. Once the key bed log is removed, turn the key bed over so the top side is up. You are now ready to measure the solenoid slot location. F. Remove the DAG blocks. The DAG blocks hold the back of the action down. Usually they fall in the slot. Therefore the DAG blocks need to be removed. Remove all screws that hold the DAG blocks down. Use a chisel or wood block to knock the DAG blocks off the key bed. 7. Mark the location for the solenoid slot. Note, 
Marking the starting location for the solenoid slot is the same whether the key bed comes off or not. A. For pianos with the key bed removed. Place the key frame on the key bed and line up the marks made in 1C. Mark the key bed at the key frame cut on the base and treble ends. Note, if you have the slot locating tool, this would be a good time to use and save some time. Mark the front key bed cut line. Remove the key frame. Measure 11 sixteenths of an inch or 18 millimeters towards the front of the key bed to establish the front solenoid cut line. Do this at both the base and treble ends. Now measure 4 and 5 eighths of an inch or 117 millimeters to the rear of the piano to establish the back of the solenoid slot. Do this at both the base and treble ends. Connect both the front and rear solenoid slot lines. Using the slot locating tool to locate the slot. Place the key bed square against the edge of the key bed. Align the slide with the end of the keyframe mark. Loosen the wing nut and slide the slot marking slide so that the correct notch corresponds with the keyframe mark you made on the key bed. Tighten the wing nut to hold this measurement. With a pencil, mark the key bed on the notches that define the back side and the front of the slot. Do this measurement for both the treble and base locations. Locating the end of the slot. From the end of the keyframe mark on the key bed, add a half inch or 13 millimeters for additional room for the key solenoids. Do this for the base and treble ends to establish the end of the slot. Note, if you need to drop more solenoids, repeat step 3A to define the top and bottom notes of the piano disc system and correct the scale stick. Make sure these marks are accurate as you will use these marks to define the front to back and end dimensions for the slot you will cut in the key bed. Place the key frame in the piano with the end blocks in place. Mark a pencil line along the back edge of the key frame cut. Do this on the base and treble ends only including the end cut of the key frame. Make sure these marks are accurate as you will use these marks to define the front to back dimensions for the slot you will cut in the key bed. Remove the keyframe. Transfer the keyframe line to the bottom side of the key bed. Note, if you have the slot marking tool, this is a good time to use it. Use the slot marking tool to locate the slot. Place the slot marking tool inside the piano with the key bed square against the edge of the key bed at the treble end. Align the slide with the end of the key frame mark. Loosen the wing nut and slide the slot marking slide so that the key frame notch corresponds with the key frame mark you made on the key bed. Tighten the wing nut to hold this measurement. Move the slot marking jig to the bottom side of the piano at the treble end. With a pencil, mark the key bed on the notches that define the back side and front of the slot. Now do this measurement for the base location as it may not be the same as the treble. If the slot locating jig is not available, use the following procedure. Measure from the keyframe line on the key bed, treble side, to the front edge of the key bed and transfer this measurement to the bottom side of the key bed. Do the same measurement at the base end of the key bed. Using a drill guide, drill a 1 8 inch or 3 millimeter hole at the keyframe line to verify this is the correct location. Do this at the base and treble ends. 
Look inside the piano to see if the hole is on the keyframe cut line. If not, then correct the line on the bottom side of the keybed. Now measure from the keyframe line 11 sixteenths of an inch or 18 millimeters to locate the front solenoid slot line. Measure 4 and 5 eighths or 117 millimeters from the front solenoid slot line back to locate the rear solenoid slot line. Make these same measurements at the base end and then connect these vertical lines together creating the sides of the solenoid slot. Locate the end of slot. From the 1 eighth or 3 millimeter locating hole inside the piano measure to the end of keyframe line and transfer this measurement to the bottom of the keybed. Do this for base and treble ends. Now add a half inch or 13 millimeters to the end of slot locations for additional room for key solenoids. Connect the end of slot lines and you are ready to cut the slot. Note if you need to drop more solenoids, repeat step 3A to define the top and bottom notes for the piano disc system and correct the scale stick. Make sure these marks are accurate as you will use these marks to define the front to back and end dimensions for the slot you will cut in the key bed. 8. Prepare to cut the solenoid slot. Note, at this point, it is best to plug the old shift lever hole if the forward key solenoid slot line goes through it. It would be difficult to fill this later after cutting the slot. Note, if the rear shift lever mounting block is 3 quarters of an inch or 19 millimeters from the forward slot line, then you can skip this step as the shift lever and liar log will not need to be moved. You will find that most pianos under 7 feet will need the shift lever and liar log moved forward. Plug the old shift lever hole in the key bed. Cut a plug for the old shift lever hole from the material that will be cut out from the key bed to make the solenoid slot. Cut the plug oversize and then fit it to the hole. When done, there should be a good snug fit. Use epoxy or wood glue to secure the plug into place. Use wax paper and a board to make the plug come out flat with the rest of the key bed. 9. Cutting the solenoid slot. Note, never use a sawzall or jigsaw for cutting the slot. Only use a circular saw or router for a straight cut and the jigsaw to finish the ends. A sawzall or jigsaw will not produce a straight cut. It is also recommended to use a straight edge or guide for a straight cut. A. For pianos with the key bed attached, drill the corners. Measure the thickness of the key bed. Put a 3 8 inch drill bit in an electric drill. Set up a masking tape flag on the drill bit at the thickness of the key bed. This precaution will keep the drill bit from bursting out the other side, causing splintering on the top side of the key bed. Drill through the key bed, making sure to keep the drill as close to perfectly vertical as possible. Drill one corner at each end of the slot for the jigsaw blade access. Wedge the damper tray. Wedge up the damper tray away from the saw blade. Note, always cut the ends of slots first. If the end cuts are done last, the saw blade may bind and the saw will come at you very quickly. Cut ends of the solenoid slot. Use an electric jigsaw. Set the depth of the saw blade so that it will cut through the key bed yet will not reach the wedged up damper action. 
If there is not a height adjustment for the jigsaw, you can grind off the blade for clearance. Cut the sides of the solenoid slot. Note, it is best to use a guide for the circular saw for a straight and clean cut. Use a circular saw. Set the depth of the saw blade so that it will cut through the key bed yet will not reach the wedged up damper action. Saw both sides of the solenoid cut. Remove the remaining material from the cut. Finish the cuts and clean up corners. Use an electric jigsaw. Finish the circular saw cuts with the jigsaw. From both directions, cut into the rounded corner so that the corner is square rather than round. Smooth the cuts in the slot. Use a double cut file to clean up any rough spots. Sand with 100 grit sandpaper to remove any splinters. Sand with 220 grit sandpaper to finish. B. For pianos with the key bed not attached. Drill the access holes. Put a 3 8 or 10 millimeter drill bit in an electric drill. Set up a masking tape flag on the drill bit at the thickness of the key bed. This precaution will keep the drill bit from bursting out the other side, causing splintering on the top side of the key bed. Drill one hole at each end of the slot for the jigsaw blade access. Drill through the key bed, making sure to keep the drill as close to perfectly vertical as possible. Cut ends of the solenoid slot. Use an electric jigsaw. Saw both ends from the holes in the corners. Cut the front side of the solenoid slot. Use a circular saw. Use a guide so the saw will cut straight. Cut the back side of the solenoid slot. Use a circular saw. Use a guide so the saw will cut straight. Finish cutting slot and clean up corners. From the circular saw cuts, use a jigsaw and cut to the corner of the solenoid slot. Remove the remaining material from the cut. Make the corners square and straight. Smooth the cuts in the slot. Use a double cut file to clean up any rough spots. Sand with 100 grit sandpaper to remove any splinters. Sand with 220 grit sandpaper to finish. 10. Reinforce the key bed. A. On the old system. If the key bed was the traditional tongue and groove as in a Steinway, it was necessary to reinforce the key bed. This was because the slot removed surrounding support to the plank in question and the old rail cover had no structural strength. On the new low profile system, it is no longer necessary to reinforce the key bed. The tray on which the system is mounted is heavy gauge steel shaped like structural channel. Because the tray is so sturdy, when attached to the key bed, the tray reinforces the key bed, tongue and groove or otherwise. 11. Cut leg tops to clear the solenoid slot. A. Get the appropriate legs for the base and treble sides of the key bed. Usually the manufacturer designates the location of the legs. As part of the teardown procedure, you mark the tops of the legs indicating their position in the piano. If the manufacturer did not designate the location of the legs, it means when the piano was made that the legs would work in any of the three locations. After piano disc installation, this is no longer true. Once you modify legs for piano disc, all three legs will become unique and thus will only work when attached in their designated locations. B. Attach legs to the key bed. Attach the base and treble legs to the key bed. C. Mark legs for the slot location. 
Trace the slot location on the top of the legs in the base and treble locations. If the leg is attached to the key bed with a wedged interlock, you may need to add an additional 3 eighths of an inch or 10 millimeters so that the leg can be installed or removed. D. Mark the legs on the finished side so you can see the lines. Note, in most cases you will be notching an L at the end of the legs and not the U shape as in illustration 58. It all depends on the location of the leg. Tape the area of the leg top in which the cut will occur. From the marks on the key bed side of the leg top, use a square to transfer them to the finished side of the leg top. When done, you should have the notch in the leg marked just like you measured it on the key bed side of the leg. In most cases, the notch will go to the end of the leg. E. Cut legs. Secure the leg so it cannot move during cutting. Use an electric jigsaw to cut the legs. On some legs it may be necessary to use a pull saw to make the cut because of the thickness of the legs. File and sand the area of the leg cut. Stain or paint the exposed area of the leg top to match the appearance of the bottom of the piano. 12. Assemble the tray, solenoid rails, and guide solenoids. Note, to make access for the end plates, please go to the addendum 3 on page 80 and view the procedure for rail clearance at this time before cutting the solenoid rails. A. Calculate the length of the solenoid rails. Measure from the base end of the rail three quarters of an inch or 19 millimeters and mark. This is where the bottom note in the system will occur on the rail. This line represents the center of the plunger stem. Lay the key end scale stick on the rail. Mark on the rail where the top note in the system will fall from the key end scale stick. Measure out from the top note Mark 3 quarters of an inch or 19 millimeters and mark. This is the end of the rail mark. The rail should be about 6 millimeters shorter than the slot you defined. Measure the length of the slot and the rail length just designed and confirm. If the numbers do not work, look for your error. Do not continue until any discrepancies are resolved. Mark the second solenoid rail to the same length. Note, before cutting the rails, please go to the addendum 3 on page 79 for instructions for the end plate clearance. B. Cut the rails. Use a square and a scribe to mark a square cut line on both rails as designed. Use a bandsaw to cut the rails as designed. C. Design the length of the tray. The tray should be a quarter of an inch or six millimeters longer than the solenoid rails and cover the slot. Mark the length of the tray. Measure from one end of the tray the total length needed and mark tray for cut. The length of the tray should just cover the solenoid slot. Use a square and a scribe to scratch a square cut line. D. Cut the tray. Use a hacksaw, a powered hacksaw, or a metal cutting bandsaw to cut the tray to length. File off the end of the rail and color with a permanent black marker. E. Mount the solenoid rails on the tray. Position both solenoid rails in from each end by an eighth of an inch or three millimeters. Use six hex screws through the mounting holes in the tray to attach each rail. Mount both rails and if correct, mount all screws into the rails. F. 
mounting end key solenoid assemblies. No. Temporarily place the solenoid rest felt in the tray for the support of the plunger as you must drill a sauce noodle hole before securing the felt to the tray. Mount the base solenoid so that the center of the lowest note in the system is 3 quarters of an inch or 19 millimeters in from the end of the rail. Place the end solenoids on the rails. Using the scale stick, align and attach the key solenoid assemblies. Locate the tray assembly left to right so that the solenoid plungers are as close to centered under the key ends as possible. Verify the alignment is correct looking from the top through the strings. Place two mounting screws into each end of the tray assembly. 13. Installing the trap work. A. Locate the shift lever in relation to the cover tray. Locate the 3 inch line drawn on the bottom of the key bed in step 2H. If the line is on the top of the key bed, then transfer it to the bottom. Hold the shift lever assembly with the mounting blocks attached 1 16th of an inch from the cover tray flange at the 3 inch line. If the cover tray is not on the key bed, place the rear lia block 3 quarters of an inch from the solenoid slot cut. Mark the center location for the shift lever hole on the 3 inch line. Figure from the 3 inch mark the amount the shift lever was moved from the original location. This will be the same distance to move the liar log. B. Drilling shift lever hole. Prepare for the drilling. Mark the center of the hole with a center punch. Cover the spot where the drill will emerge on the bottom of the key bed with a piece of soft wood. Clamp the piece of wood into place so the key bed cannot splinter. Drill the new shift lever hole. Use an inch and a half or 38 millimeter Forstner drill bit or a hole saw. Drill through the key bed making sure to drill vertically until you are into the protective piece of wood. A drill guide is recommended. Remove the clamp and protective piece of wood. C. Mount the Laria log on the key bed. Place the log on the key bed at the new location. The new log location is determined by the amount the shift lever needs to move. Mark the hole locations and pilot the screw holes. Flag the drill bit with tape slightly less than the thickness of the key bed. Drill the pilot holes. Mount the key bed to the new location. D. Mount the tray assembly on the key bed. Atta on the bench. Place the end of section keys on the key frame with the top action attached. Set the action on the key bed using the marks you made to locate the action. Block up the ends of the key bed with saw horses so that you can position the tray assembly under the keys. Using a cart or table to support tray assembly, locate the tray assembly front to back under the solenoid slot such that the inside steel surface of the tray is aligned with the front edge of the solenoid slot. Elevate the tray assembly so the tray flange is against the key bed. Locate the tray assembly left to right so that the solenoids are as close to centered under the key end keys as possible. The back row of solenoids should be 3 eighths of an inch or 6 millimeters onto the keys. Install two mounting screws into each end of the tray assembly. In the piano, remove the top action from the keyframe. Place only the end of section keys on the keyframe. Move the keyframe into the action cavity and position properly with end blocks. 
Locate the tray assembly front to back over the solenoid slot such that the inside steel surface of the tray is aligned with the front edge of the solenoid slot. Locate the tray assembly up and down so that the solenoids are as close to centered under the keys as possible. The back row of solenoids should be 3 8 of an inch onto the keys. You can see this from the top through the strings. Install two mounting screws into each end of the tray assembly. E. Mount the key bed to the piano if not attached. Place the key bed on the piano with the tray assembly attached. Secure with one screw at each end. Place the key frame into the piano with end blocks in place. F. Mounting the shift lever. Note, ideally this is the best way to locate the shift lever on the key bed. Because of the leverage in the shift lever, even a small error is potentially a big problem. It is impossible to know where the shift lever should be positioned left to right, or in this case up and down, unless the action is held firmly against the base stop block by the shift spring. Center the dome nut on the liar rod. Center the shift lever front to back in the hole. Make sure the pad is aligned correctly with the pedal rod. Slide the shift lever up until it engages the keyframe. Secure shift lever with the original screws. Check to make sure that there is no slack between the shift lever and the keyframe. Correct now if you have this problem. G. Calculating and making sustain lever. Note on using the right equipment. When drilling the trap work, it is best to use a drill press to drill all the holes accurately at 90 degrees. Note. The following trap work parts are supplied in the kit for the sustain and sostenuto trap work. Two pieces of maple wood, one inch by one inch by 24 inches. Two metal pivot brackets. Eight number eight by one inch black hex head mounting screws. Place the liar on the piano. Measure from the sustained pedal rod to an approximate point where the old pitman arm made contact with the damper tray. Average out this distance according to the angle which will be needed on the sustain lever. Please refer to the following illustrations. H. Installing the pedal solenoid. Note. It may be necessary to place a block of wood on the beam as a spacer for better alignment. Locating and installing the pedal solenoid. Glue felt supplied with the solenoid to the side of the pedal solenoid to cushion between the beam and solenoid. Center the sustain lever over the solenoid rail cover outline. Place the pedal solenoid on the beam aligning with the 6 inch location established in the previous step. Attach the pedal solenoid with black screws number 6 by 1 inch supplied in the kit. The distance from the sustained pedal rod to the approximate new hole location on the damper tray should be 60% of the total measurement from the sustained pedal rod to the lever pivot. From pivot point to the sustained pedal solenoid location will be an additional 6 inches back on most pianos. Please refer to the following illustration. Hold the lever in position as shown above to determine how long the lever will be, where you must drill for the pitman and pivot pin. Mark these locations and proceed with making the sustain lever. Where the sustain lever makes contact with the pedal solenoid, mark a half inch past the three quarter inch nut on the pedal solenoid contact area and place a mark to cut off excess lever. 
Once the lever is cut to size, paint it to match the original color of the original levers. Installing the stop block and stop screw. This is a method of adjustment that all Mason and Hamlin pianos are now equipped with. The idea is to make the stop screw easy to access. The stop pad is used for the stop screw. The spring leather will prevent the spring from making any kind of undesirable noise while the felt will keep the spring aligned. Mark the location for the glide bolt. Locate the glides, stop locks, springs, felt, leather, and screws in the kit. Place. Place the glide bolt one inch behind the liar rod contact point. Drill a 5 16 inch hole and tap with a 3 8 inch 16 tap. Install the glide bolt into the lever. Locate the position for the stop lock under the glide and glue in place on the key bed. Make final adjustments later. Mark the location for the sustain return spring. Usually the ideal location is one to two inches from the pivot pin. Install the leather felt at this location on the key bed with the screw and washer provided. Note how the screw and washer, when tightened, make a snug fit for the spring. Place the spring on the leather and install lever locating the spring contact point on the lever. Remove the lever and glue on the 3 quarter inch white felt at the spring location. Use a contact cement for the white felt. Pianos with no support beam. In this case, it is necessary to install a beam of wood to mount the sustained solenoid and possibly a speaker. Use a 4 inch by 6 inch piece of wood attached by metal L brackets on the belly rail. At the rear end of the piano, use glue and attach to the leg base console with two screws. I. Finish preparing of sustain lever. Installing the rubber grommet in the damper tray. With the sustain lever back in place, look down the sustain lever and at the damper tray. Mark the location to drill a 2364 hole for a rubber grommet. Locate the rubber grommet supplied in the kit and glue in the grommet with contact cement or super glue. Center the sustained pedal rod on the lyre and center the 3 quarter inch nut on the pedal solenoid. This is important for adjustability later. Place the appropriate felt and spacer, if necessary, between the sustain lever and pedal rod. The front part of the lever should have either leather or felt placed between the lyre pedal rod and the lever. Prepare the threaded rod. Place a self-locking nut on the 832nd rod with a half inch of rod exposed. Glue a flat washer onto the nut for more support area. Use super glue or contact cement. Measuring and cutting the threaded rod. Place the threaded rod nut end into the grommet on the damper tray. Now pull the dampers down to the strings and damper tray up to the damper levers. Now mark the threaded rod to be cut off flush with the bottom of the sustain lever. At the same time, mark location where threaded rod hole will be drilled on the sustain lever. Cut the threaded rod to make flush with the bottom of damper lever. File off the threads and install a self-locking nut at the distance of 3 quarter inches and glue a flat washer to the nut with contact cement. Drilling lever for threaded rod hole. Remove the threaded rod and sustain lever. With a 1 quarter inch drill bit, drill through the sustain lever where the pitman will be located. Now with a 2364 drill bit, drill halfway through the quarter inch hole you just drilled through the lever. 
glue grommet in place with CA or super glue. Locating and installing sustained pedal return spring. On most pianos, the sustained pedal feels lighter than the original trap work. To replace the same feel to the pedal, a spring can be added to the sustained pedal as follows. Remove the bottom of the lyre and the sustained pedal. Drill a one inch hole half inch deep into the lyre. Felt the circumference to the hole with thin felt. Place the spring in the hole and reassemble the lyre. J. Making and installing the sostenuto lever. Please note, piano disc requires a working sostenuto on all pianos if so equipped. Note, for American Steinway pianos with the sostenuto on the action, please refer to the addendum at the end of this manual. Note, the following trap work parts are supplied in the kit for the sustain and sostenuto trap work. Two pieces of maple wood, one inch by one inch by 24 inches. Two metal pivot brackets. Eight, number eight by one inch black hex head mounting screws. Please refer to the first steps provided in trap work installation that refers as to how the sostenuto push versus pull configurations are identified. Please note, if the sostenuto is a push, although it is possible to use two lever system, we recommend that you we will be describing in the steps that follow these illustrations that show how push and pull levers are based on the location of the fulcrum pivot location. Check the sostenuto rod installed in the piano to decide if it is a push type or a pull type sostenuto. Note, with pull type, the clip is on the front side. With a push type, the clip is on the rear side of the sostenuto rod. Please refer to the following illustration. The following will provide a description of how you can locate the fulcrum pivot location of any lever to convert the lever from a push to a pull type configuration. Push or pull type sostenuto. Note, this procedure below of locating the hole location through the solenoid tray is for either push pull sostenuto system. Mount the tray to the piano at the predetermined location with screws slightly loose to slip the wedge under the tray. Place a wedge of wood at the sostenuto mark that was marked previously. Secure the wedge of wood to the key bed. This wedge will help locate where the threaded rod is located on the tray and sostenuto lever. Please refer to the following illustration. Mark the location of the tray flange on the wedge for a reference. Note, at this time mount the sauce noodle lever back on the piano and locate the pitman rod on the tray. Make sure to use a square to locate hole correctly. Remove the tray and mark the 90 degree location of the threaded rod to the wedge. Now remove the wedge in place of the tray. Mark the pitman location on the tray. Note, there are two optional tools that will cut the hole in the tray cover. On the left, the Greenlee hole punch and on the right, the carbide drill. For the Greenlee hole punch, drill a 2364th hole through the tray at the location mark. Do this on both the sostenuto and sustain locations at this time. Place the hex head bolt on the outside of the tray and the cutter on the inside. Use either an impact wrench with a six point socket or a ratchet and socket. Note, for the Greenlee hole punch, it is important to lubricate the threads of the hole punch occasionally for long life. The Greenlee hole punch number 35178 can be purchased from many companies online. The carbide drill can be purchased from Blair Equipment Company 
part number 14732. Making the push type sauce nudo trap work. Note, for American Steinway pianos, please go to the addendum 1 on page 76 at the end of this manual for additional information. Mount the rail cover back on the key bed. You will need to make a pattern of the sostenuto lever. Use a paper or transparent material to create the pattern. It will take some observation and calculation to determine the shape needed. Place the pattern as shown on the key bed and draw the shape needed on the paper. Once you have finished the pattern, transfer it to a piece of plywood. The plywood is not supplied in the kit and we recommend that you use a good quality plywood such as Baltic birch. Use a thickness of 3 quarter inch to an inch plywood. Cut out the plywood pattern and sand to create a look more symmetrical and appealing to the overall visual appearance. Since this lever shape is made of plywood, you will need to place a hardwood support for the pivot pins. In this case, we used maple, which is applied in the kit. Design the plywood lever to attach a hardwood support area. Another option is to just join the plywood and hardwood pieces with a simple butt joint secured with two wood screws. Make sure the glued surface is rough for a good glue joint. Use 60 or 80 grit sandpaper to rough up wood surface. Use a two inch wood screw to screw the two pieces together. Drill an access hole through the plywood. Drill a pilot hole into the hardwood. Be careful not to make the hole too small. Attach the two pieces together with wood glue. Glue and clamp the hardwood support to the plywood lever. This is an important step as this support is necessary. Once the lever is cut and assembled, it is ready for the final additions. Round off all corners and sand all surfaces for painting. Paint the lever black or other color that will match the color of the original trap work. Locate the metal pivot bracket and pins in the kit. The single bracket will need to be cut in half to create two brackets. The single pin in illustration 89 will also need to be cut in half to create two one inch pins to be attached to each side of the trap work. Cut off the tag as it will not be used. Drill an 11 fourths hole one half inch deep into the hardwood at each end of the lever for the pivot pins. Glue each pin with epoxy for a good secure fit. Add the glide stop screw. Place the glide bolt one inch behind the liar rod contact point. Drill a 5 16 inch hole and tap with a 3 8 inch by 16 tap. Install the glide bolt into the lever. Locate the position for the stop lock and glue in place. Make final adjustments later. Another stop lock is glued to the key bed towards the back of the lever for the return spring. Please refer to the following illustration below. Locate a piece of leather that's in the kit and add to the location where the lever will rest on the liar rod. A hole is drilled in the lever to accommodate the threaded rod. Note, when the threaded rod is attached to the lever, there will be a felt washer, a metal washer, and a lock nut on each side of the lever that will hold the threaded rod securely to the lever. The pull style Sashnudo is a single lever system which will work on most pianos. Piano Disc has provided the lever and pivot bracket in the kit. The following instructions will aid you in assembling and installing this lever. Locate the hardwood lever and bracket in the kit. Measure the total length of the lever from the pedal rod to the contact point on the sostenuto rod. Drill a 5 seconds pivot hole 
half the distance of the lever. Install the lever into the bracket with the pivot pin provided. Place the lever on the key bed, aligning with the pedal rod and mark for the clearance of the shift pedal if necessary. Now using the excess wood from the lever supplied, make a lap joint to extend to contact the pedal rod. Make the cut on the two pieces of wood and attach the lap joint with wood glue and screws. Place the lever back on the key bed and measure for the distance to the sostenuto rod. Using the excess wood from the levers supplied, make the lap joint, glue, and screw together. Sand the lever rounding off the sharp edges and paint to the desired finish. Glue on the leather for the pedal rod contact and felt for the stop screw. Attach the lever to the piano. Adding the adjustable glide bolt and return spring. The adjustable glide bolt should be located just slightly behind the liar rod towards the tray. Mark the location for the glide bolt. Drill a 5 16 inch hole and tap with a 3 h by 16 tap. Install the glide bolt into the lever. Locate the position for the stop lock and glue in place. Locate the two 1 and an eighth inch leather punchings and two 11 16 felt punchings, two mounting screws, and two washers in the kit. Select a location for the spring, usually next to the stop screw at the lap joint location. Attach the felt leather with the screw and washer provided. Note how the screw and washer, when tightened, will make a snug fit for the spring. Locate the two white felt, 3 quarter inch by 1 inch, in the trap work baggie. This felt is placed on the lever to cushion the spring. Attaching the threaded rod to the sostenuto coupler. Before proceeding, it is important to determine exactly how the sostenuto linkage is connected on that particular piano you are working on. The sostenuto coupler varies a great deal from one piano to another. In examples A through C, the rod connects in various ways. In example A, use a 5 8 by 2 and a half inch wood dowel to make the connection. Approximately half of the rod must be cut off. Using the correct size of die, thread one inch of the rod. Then use the correct size of drill bit, interference fit, to drill the dowel. Use super glue on the rods during assembly for a permanent bond. Fourteen, adjusting the key solenoid plungers. Key beds that are not removable. This is a rough adjustment as the final adjust for key beds that are not removable will be done with the piano on its legs. The solenoid plungers will arrive pre assembled. You will need to adjust the solenoid plungers. B. Decide on the initial length of the solenoid plungers. Measure the thickness of the key bed. Measure the height of the back of the keys above the key bed. Add these two measurements and add 3 eighths inch for the amount of plunger in the tray. This is the approximate length you will need for the solenoid plungers. C. Set adjusting jig to the calculated plunger length. Adjust all plungers to length. Place the correct sample solenoid plunger into jig. Adjust the bolt to the rubber plunger tip. Adjust all solenoid plungers in the same manner. Key beds that are removable. With the key bed on the table and the solenoid tray attached in its final location, a final adjustment is easy to accomplish at this time. Place the keys on the keyframe and attach the stack or top action. 
place action on the key bed with the end blocks and the correct side to side location. Place the solenoid tray on the key bed with eight mounting screws. Place a key solenoid plunger in a solenoid and adjust the height. This will be the sample for all the plunger heights. The, a gap of 10 thousandths is acceptable, but it's better to be kept as close as possible. B. Set adjusting jig to the calculated plunger length. Adjust all plungers to length. Place the correct sample solenoid plunger into jig. Adjust the bolt to the rubber plunger tip. Adjust all solenoid plungers in the same manner. In the following pictures, dimensions are provided so that you can duplicate this jig that will be used with all future piano disc installations. Piano Disc also supplies a kit with this tool. 15. Install key solenoids. Install the tray end cover plates. Locate the tray end cover plates in the kit. Place the end cover plates at the end of the tray and center punch the hole locations. Drill a 3 30 seconds hole at the center punch locations. Drill a second hole 1 8 inch through the tray from the outside to clean up metal debris. The 1 8 is just an access hole and the screw will thread into the cover plate. Attach the end plates with the screws supplied. Please see the addendum 3 on page 79 at the end of this manual for further instructions on installing the end plates. C. Install a key solenoid felt. Locate the key solenoid felt in the kit. Cut the felt the same length as the solenoid rails. Place the felt on the tray between the rails. Locate the saucer noodle hole on the felt with a marker. Cut the hole in the felt with a hole punch or knife. Secure the felt in the tray at each end with contact cement or CA glue. D. Mount the solenoids to the rails. Place the correct number of solenoids on each section. Install the plungers. Place the scale stick on the tray aligning with the end of section solenoids. Align and attach all key solenoids. Mount the remaining solenoids so that the lowest note in the system is a half inch in from the end of the rail. Attach the screw to the front rail. Set the rest of the solenoid bracket assemblies with plungers on the rails. Lay the key scale stick between the rows of plunger stems. Move the front and back solenoids so they align with the key end scale stick. Fasten the solenoid bracket to both rails using a hex screw provided for this purpose in the kit. Cut the wires from the solenoids that will not be used. You will not insert plungers into these solenoids either. Twist the wires from each solenoid. Take a damper wire and bend a hook in the end of the wire. Place the wire in a drill. With the hook, twist the solenoid wire four full turns for all solenoids. Yep. 16. Assemble driver boards to the solenoid tray. A. Position driver boards for assembly. Lay the driver boards on the bench on the appropriate side of the tray. The driver boards will mount in the space between the back rail and the edge of the tray. Do not mount the driver boards until after burn-in. B. Plug solenoids into the driver boards. Remember that if you have emitted solenoids, you need to plug the lowest note in the system onto the appropriate pins for that note in the driver board. 
Pay attention in crossing breaks as the color pattern may not be black white as you have become accustomed to in the past. C. Connect the data cables between the driver boards. The cables that go between the driver boards are gray, relatively short, and have RJ45 connectors. These go between driver boards 1 and 2 and between driver boards 2 and 3. These cables deliver 5 VDC and data to play the music. D. Connect the power data cable for the sustained pedal solenoid. This is an extension cable about 24 inches long, black with a round connector on one end and a red connector on the other. In the case of servicing the system, you are able to disconnect this cable on the outside of the belly rail for ease of lowering the solenoid tray. Connect red connector to the base driver board. The socket will be right next to the power connector on the driver board. Connect other end to the pedal solenoid. E. Connect the 40 volt power ribbon cable between the boards. There are three white plugs that go into the driver boards and one black plug that goes to the power supply. This cable supplies 42 VDC for the key solenoid operation. Plug the end white plug into the treble driver board. Plug the remaining white plugs into the tenor and bass driver boards. The remaining black plug will go into the power supply. 17. Set up for burn-in. A. Set up a power supply, an IQ box, and a CPU on the bench. These should be close to the tray and solenoid assembly so the cords will reach. B. Connect data to the CPU. Attach the RJ45 flat data cable from the base driver board to the CPU. This is a flat ribbon cable and must be in this position. C. Connect data cable to the IQ. Connect an RJ45 data cable from the IQ box to the CPU. This is a round cable and must be in this position. D. Connect power to the CPU. Connect the 10 volt power cable from the power supply to the CPU. E. Connect power 40 volts to the driver boards. Connect the black plug on the 40 volt gray ribbon cable into the power supply. F. Connect power 10 volts to the IQ. Connect the 10 volt power to the IQ box. G. Connect power to the power supply. Connect the big power supply cord to power strip. Connect the 10 volt power supply cord to power strip. 18. Burn in the unit. A. The purpose of burn-in is to find and replace any parts that might fail. Note, after burn-in, the plunger tip should be readjusted if there is any lost motion. Use a burn-in dish to run the PD system for 24 hours. 19. Install driver boards into the tray assembly. Note, the driver boards are mounted onto the back side of the back solenoid rail. The mounting flange on the driver board bracket has holes that you will position between solenoid brackets. Use two mounting screws half inch hex head on each driver board into the back solenoid rail to mount. It is possible that you will need to drill an additional mounting hole in the driver board bracket. A. Position the tenor driver board. 
Position the tenor driver board so that the sustained pitman hole falls in the area where there's nothing protruding from the circuit board. Make sure that the two screws can be used to mount the driver board to the rail between the sustenuto brackets. B. Position the base driver board. If able to position the driver board entirely in the base section, do so. If not possible, position the base driver board so that the sostenuto hole falls in the area of the circuit board where nothing protrudes. Make sure that the two screws can be used to mount the driver board to the rail between the sostenuto brackets. C. Position the treble driver board. Position more or less centered on the solenoids connected to the board. Make sure that the two screws can be used to mount the driver board to the rail between the sostenuto brackets. D. Attach the driver boards to the back solenoid rail. Use a longer version of the screws that are used to mount the solenoid brackets to attach the driver boards to the back solenoid rail. E. Route wires in the tray. Route the data wires. Make sure adequate clearance is maintained and they fit neatly into the slot. Make sure the external data cable is coming out the base end of the tray assembly. Route the solenoid wires. Bundle solenoid wires so that they are neat and tidy. Make sure the solenoid wires fall in the cutout in the solenoid bracket neatly. Route the 40 volt power cable. Make sure the cable clears all obstructions. Make sure the black power cord is attached. Twenty. Drill hole in the belly rail for wires. A. Mark the hole in the belly rail for key bed not removable. The center of the hole should be about two to five inches in from the end of the slot in the key bed. If notes are left off, this hole location will vary. It depends on the base driver board location. Once the driver boards are attached to the solenoid tray, measure from the end of the tray to the base driver board, and this will be the distance for the hole in the belly rail. Look inside the piano, making sure there is nothing in the way of the drilling location. Drill the hole with a one inch Forstner bit. 21. Mount the CPU. A. Position the CPU. Usually the CPU is mounted on the back side of the belly rail close to the hole you cut in the belly rail to route wires. If the belly rail is not a good location, then place the CPU on the side of a beam. B. Mount the CPU. Attach the CPU with the screws provided and include the ground strap under the CPU. See Ground Strap Installation, Chapter 29. 22. Mount the power supply. Note. On current piano disc units, there are two power supplies. The larger power supply provides 40 volt to the driver boards. The smaller power supply provides 10 volts to the CPU and other electronics. A. Position the 40 volt power supply. Position the 40 volt power supply on the rim on the base side of the piano unless the piano requires you to mount it somewhere else. Okay. If the piano will not permit, then locate the 40 volt power supply as close as possible to the wire holes on some other physical feature of the piano, like the rim or a rim strut. B. Mount the 40 volt power supply. Attach the 40 volt power supply with the screws provided, including the ground strap under the power supply. 
C. Position the 10 volt power supply. Position the 10 volt power supply on a rim strut close to the main power supply. D. Mount the 10 volt power supply. Attach the 10 volt power supply with the Velcro provided for this purpose. Place the Velcro at the desired location and secure with two staples. Secure each cable with twist ties or zip ties with eyelets supplied in the kit. 23. Mount the power strip. A. Position the power strip. Usually the power strip is mounted on a rim strut of the piano. This would imply the power cord for the piano disc unit would come down the back leg. B. Mount the power strip. Attach the power strip with the two screws provided and secure in place with a screw at the end. The end screw will prevent the plug strip from sliding off the mounting screws. C. Mounting the speakers. Remove the speakers from the box and locate the mounting hardware. Put the speaker on the beam at the selected location a quarter inch from the soundboard. Mark a line on the speaker at the bottom of the beam. Mount the bracket on the appropriate set of screw holes at the side of the speaker. Use the silver self-tapping screw supplied to mount the bracket to the speaker. Mount the speaker with two black hex head screws to the beam. Place the screw on the side of the speaker near the power switch to stabilize the speaker to the beam. Connect the power cable to the speaker and the multi-plug strip. Connect the RCA to the speaker and make sure to keep this cable away from the power cable. 24. Installing to key bed to the piano. A. This is a job for two people as the key bed gains some weight with the key solenoid assembly attached. Place a large piano moving rubber band around the key solenoid plungers to prevent them from falling out while installing the key bed. Prepare yourself with a rubber mallet close at hand and a clear path. Carefully, two people pick up the key bed and place onto the guide pins. Use the rubber mallet to tap the key bed into place and secure with the original screws. 26. Set the height of the adjustable plungers. Note. In the past, the piano disc plungers were not adjustable. The tip mounted on the stem in a precise location. A felt pad on the bottom of the tip controlled how far down the plunger sat in the bobbin and thus the stroke of the solenoid. The relationship of the solenoid to the keys was set by moving the mounting rail up or down until the rubber tip of the plunger was as close as possible to the key. On the low profile piano disc system, the height of the plungers is achieved in an entirely different way. Each plunger has a stem with threads. A plastic nut with a rubber tip adjusts up or down to achieve the proper height. The rail height, unlike previous piano disc systems, is not adjustable. To adjust the solenoids to the keys, you will need a tool similar to a damper under lever height gauge to set the height of the plungers. A. On the bench. Place all keys on the keyframe and attach the top action. Place the tray assembly into place on the key bed with all screws attached. Locate the keyframe at correct location on the key bed. Adjust the heights of the plungers to the bottom of the keys. The plunger tip should be as close to the key as possible and not have more than four thousandths gap. B. In the piano. Measure the back key heights. Use a damper under lever height gauge to measure the back key height. Set the action on a flat bench. Measure the back key height so that the gauge matches the bottom of the key. 
set the plunger heights. Set the damper height gauge on the key bed. Use a damper under lever height gauge to set the plunger height. Hold the gauge over the plungers to see the amount of adjustment necessary. Lift the plunger out of the solenoid and turn the plastic nut until the rubber tip just touches the damper height gauge. Place the action into the piano and verify there is a straight hammer line. 27. Set up communication with the piano disc system. Note, older piano disc units featured a control box that used floppy disks or CDs. If you have one of these in your shop, it can still be useful for communicating with the piano disc unit for the purpose of configuration. If not, you will need to set up communications with the piano disc unit and use iPhone or iPad to run the configuration suites. If the unit is shipped with an Airport Express, that is straightforward. If not, you can plug your iPhone or iPad directly into the control box in order to configure the piano disc unit. A. Set up communications with the PD system in order to configure. Plug in either a 128 or a 228 control box. Set up Airport Express. Plug an iPhone or iPad that has the configuration suite installed into the CPU. 28. Adjust the pedal solenoid. Note. Adjust the stroke of the pedal solenoid so that the dampers are lifted off the string 1 16th of an inch. There may be times when, as a result of poor regulation or worn parts, the stroke in the pedal solenoid must be set longer. The shorter the stroke on the pedal solenoid, the less heat will develop. Less heat in the solenoid translates to a longer life for the pedal solenoid. In the bicord and tricord notes, the pedal solenoid should be set so that the wedgers do not clear the strings. The felt wedge should be between the strings but not touching either. The least amount of travel for sustain to occur is the correct setting for the pedal solenoid. A. Go over sustained damper lift to the pedal. Test to see if all dampers are lifted off the strings at the same time. Lift all dampers with sustained pedal. Using the back of your fingernail, get all the strings in the piano vibrating. Lower the dampers slowly with the sustained pedal. If the sound stops on all notes at the same time, your damper pickup is regulated properly. If the action is out of the piano, you can watch the pickup to see if they pick up together. If the damper lift needs adjustment, get a low stool to sit on. Use the sustain pedal to move the damper tray from at rest to pickup. You can see the ones that are not lifting with the others. Adjust the damper lever pickup in whatever way is required by the design of this particular damper action. On Steinways and a number of old pianos, you will need to place shims, usually balance rail punchings, between the pickup felt and the tray. On most other pianos, there will be a capstan or other screw adjustment to alter the damper pickup. B. Adjust the pedal rod for minimal free play between the damper tray and the under lever. Use the appropriate wrenches to loosen the lock nut on the sustained pedal rod. Adjust the long cap nut up or down until there is minimal travel before the dampers start to lift off the strings. You may find it necessary to adjust the pickup of the dampers if they are not currently lifting evenly. C. Adjust pedal solenoid stop pad. Note, the stop pad is circular felt pad that limits the pedal solenoid's return distance. It is with a threaded rod going through the bracket so as to control the stroke of the pedal solenoid. A lock nut holds the adjustment so that it will not change in use. 
When the pedal solenoid is mounted in the piano and the piano is on the floor, the felt pad is on the top side of the solenoid. The large hex thrust nut is on the bottom of the solenoid. Loosen the lock nut with the appropriate wrench. Turn the pedal solenoid stop pad in a clockwise direction, looking from the bottom, until it is as high as it will go. D. Adjust the pedal solenoid hexagonal thrust nut up out of the way. Loosen the lock nut with the appropriate wrench. Turn the hexagonal tip up as far as it will go so it is out of the way. E. Adjust the sustained pedal solenoid. Load damper test song 2 and press play. Song repeat can be set for continual repeat. Observe the wedge damper lift. Adjust the damper lift. Turn the hex thrust nut 3 quarter inch to adjust damper lift. From the bottom, counterclockwise will get you more lift. Clockwise will get you less lift. When lift is correct, tighten the 9 16th lock nut. Adjust loss motion in the pedal solenoid. Rotate the large steel washer with the felt pad until there is only a 16th inch of loss motion. When correct, tighten the lock nut on top of the pedal solenoid. 29. Final checklist. A. Play test disc. Verify that all solenoids, keys, and pedals are functioning properly. Verify that all functions of the controller and the remote control are functioning properly. B. Secure and neatly arrange all cables and cords to the beams with the proper fasteners. C. Check the components to ensure that they are securely installed. Power supplies, driver boards, solenoid rails, pedal solenoids. Ensure that lock nuts are tight. D. Check the solenoids to ensure that all the hammers are in the rest position. E. Repeat the playing of the test disc the note-to-note -note portion and check for the proper playing of the piano. Operate the system for at least 12 hours continuously. Recheck the piano and the piano disc system for proper operation after 12 hours of burning. 30. Ground strap installation. ESD strap installation, grand pianos, low profile system. There are two ESD straps that are included with the kit. The number one is an 18 inch strap should be attached from the bottom side of the power supply where it is screwed to the rim, then through the belly rail hole to the key solenoid rail. Note, there's a location on underside of the power supply that has exposed metal. Please make sure that the ESD strap makes contact with the surface that is exposed. Two, the number two is a 36 inch strap that attaches to the number one strap with a small screw as shown. And the other end should attach to the underside of the CPU. Please refer to the following illustration. Addendum one, Steinway Sostenuto. The American Steinway Sostenuto is different than most other pianos because they mount the Sostenuto on the top action instead of the belly rail. Also they use the key bed to guide a dowel that contacts a wooden linkage called a monkey. Since the cutting of the key bed removes this guide hole, we must find another guide. See the following steps on how we create a new guide. A. Preparing the Steinway Sostenuto Guide. Place a mark for the location of the Sostenuto on the scale stick. With the trap work lever in the correct position, use a square and mark the location for the pitman rod to contact the lever. 
parts needed for this assembly that are not supplied in the kit. One threaded rod, a quarter inch by two inches. This thin wall threaded rod can be found in the lighting section of Lowe's, Home Depot, or a hardware store. Two lock nuts for the threaded rod. One wood dowel, 3 8 inch by 2 inches. One felt punching, half inch thick. The thickness of the felt doesn't matter. One piece of thin wood or veneer. This assembly will be placed into the solenoid tray at the brake to activate the monkey. Drill a 3 16 inch hole, one half inch deep into one end of the 3 8 inch wood dowel. Glue the threaded rod, supplied in kit, into the hole with silicone glue. Only glue into the bottom half of the hole so the rod can pivot easily. This assembly works very nicely as it has some give side to side to keep from binding. Now glue the half inch felt to the end of the dowel for a soft and larger area. Glue on thin wood or veneer to the side of the monkey to secure the spring. Because the guides for the monkey were removed from the cutting of the slot, this is a simple method of controlling the spring and position of the monkey. Cut the threaded rod to two inches in length and clean off the burrs. Roll up a piece of 220 sandpaper and smooth any burrs on the inside of the threaded rod. Test the 3 8 inch dowel for fit after cleaning off the inside of the threaded rod. Install the threaded rod into the one inch punched hole and secure with two lock nuts. B. Modify the keys. Because of the guides for the monkey, they were cut away at the bottom. This wood must be replaced for the key solenoids. Use some scrap softwood to glue on the keys. Glue pieces of wood on the keys, keeping the grain running the same direction. After glue is dry, dress down the keys, forming the original shape of the keys. Addendum 2, Keyframe Modifications, Shift Lever. Because of the moving forward of the shift lever, it is necessary to move the hardwood contact point on the keyframe. Addendum 3, Clearance for End Plates. Because of the design of the end plates, it is necessary to cut a clearance on the end of each rail.